So let's check your prediction now. You can see as I move the North Pole towards the cathode rays, they feel a downwards force and move down like this. So how can we explain that with the right hand rule? Well, the magnetic field lines are pointing in the direction of the North Pole. The cathode rays, we said, were moving from the left to the right. So I need to point my thumb this way. And because cathode rays are negatively charged particles, they're going to feel a force out the back of my hand. So the force is going to be down like this. If I was to move the South Pole towards the cathode ray, in that case, the magnetic field lines are coming out the screen towards you. And so the force should be up. And you can see they do move up in that case. So let's have a look now at an example problem that we can solve with the equation F is equal to QV cross B. So the question is, an electron in an old style television picture tube moves towards the front of the tube with a speed 8.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second along the x axis. Surrounding the neck of the tube are coils of wire that create a magnetic field of magnitude 0.025 teslas directed at an angle of 60 degrees to the x-axis and lying in the x-y plane. Part A, calculate the magnetic force on the electron. Part B, describe the electric field you would need to apply to keep the electron traveling with constant velocity. Part C, what would happen to an electron with a different velocity that was placed into the electric field established in B? What would be an application of this? To start this problem, like we usually do, let's draw a diagram. So let's draw our x, y axis. Here's x, here's y, and our electron is traveling along the x axis here. And then we've got a magnetic field, which makes an angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis. So this in here is 60 degrees. And this is the magnetic field. So in order to calculate the force on the electron, we can use our equation F is equal to QV cross B. We're told in the question that V is 8 times 10 to the 6, and B is 0 0.025 Teslas. So because this is an electron, it's got a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then we've got our velocity, which is 8 times 10 to the 6. And then we've got our magnetic field, which is 0 0.025. Now, this is a cross product. And in this case, the angle between the velocity of the electron and the magnetic field is this 60 degrees in here. So to account for the cross product, we then need to multiply this by the sine 60. So we can calculate what this is on the calculator. And when we do that, we get 2.8 times 10 to the minus 14 newtons. So we've now got its magnitude, but we also need to consider its direction. So for its direction, use your right hand rule. Align your fingers with the magnetic field and point your thumb to the right. In this case, you can see that your palm is coming out the screen towards you. However, this is an electron, so it's got a negative charge. So the force on the electron is out the back of your hand, so that's going to be into the screen. So this is directed into the screen or we could say it's in the negative z direction. Now in part b, we're going to apply an electric field to keep the electron going in a straight line. So we know that the magnetic force, which is the one we calculated up here, so let's put a subscript b, just to make it really clear that that's the magnetic force, is going to have to be equal and opposite to the electric force, which is given by EQ um, in opposite direction. 
So we'll need an electric force to push the electron out the screen towards us. And we know that electric fields describe the direction of the force on the positive particle. So we're going to need an electric field into screen in the negative z direction. So to calculate its magnitude, we've got the magnitude of the magnetic force here, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 14, and that's going to be equal to E times the 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. So we just need to divide 2.8 times 10 to the minus 14 by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19, and that gives us a magnitude for our electric field of 1.7 times 10 to the 5 newtons per coulomb. And then in the final part, we're asked what would happen if an electron with a different velocity was placed in this field. So now, if V is greater than VO, so the VO here stands for the original V, so it's now going faster, this will imply FB is larger, but it hasn't changed the electric force. The electric field remains the same and the charge hasn't changed. So if FB is now bigger than the electric force, it's going to feel a force into the screen. So we'll feel a force into the screen. And if it was going slower, then the magnetic force would be smaller and it'd feel a force out of the screen. So a useful application for this would be we could use it to split charged particles based on their speeds. So this could be used experimentally as a velocity selector. It's because it would only let through charges with a specific velocity. So the next problem, in an experiment designed to measure the magnitude of a uniform magnetic field, electrons are accelerated from rest through a potential difference of 350 volts and then enter a uniform magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity vector of the electron. The electrons travel along a curved path because of the magnetic force exerted on them and the radius of the path is measured to be 7.5 centimetres. Part A, what is the magnitude of the magnetic field? Part B, what is the angular speed of the electrons? Part C, what would happen if you repeated the same experiment with helium nuclei, i.e. same potential and magnetic field applied? Part D, what is an industrial application of this? So to answer part A, we know that these are going around a circular path in the magnetic field with a radius of 7.5 centimetres. So we know that the net force acting upon them is this centripetal force. So we know that the force is given by mv squared on r and that this centripetal force comes from the magnetic force. So it comes from QV cross B. And then in the question, we are told that the velocity vector and the magnetic field are perpendicular. So this is just equal to QVB. So we now have the expression that MV squared on R is equal to QVB. And we can cancel out this velocity with this velocity. And we're trying to get the magnetic field. So we can rearrange this and write, well, B is equal to MV over RQ. The problem is that we don't currently know the speed. So in order to get the speed, we're going to need to use the potential that it was accelerated through. So when we were considering potentials and potential energy, we saw that the relationship between them was that the electrical potential was defined as the potential energy per unit charge. So we can actually write that the change in potential energy is going to be equal to the potential times the charge. And since it starts from rest, 
This is also going to be equal to the final kinetic energy. The change in potential energy will go into a change in kinetic energy. So we can rearrange this and write, well, the speed then, V, is going to be equal to 2VQ divided by M, and then we'll need to take the square root of that. So now we can substitute this speed into our equation for B up here, and we have B is equal to M over RQ times the square root of 2VQ on M. So some bits cancel up the top. This m, square root m, will cancel with this a little bit. So up the top, that's going to leave us with an m. And then we've still got the 2v. This is the potential, a capital V, as opposed to this little v, which is the velocity. And then we've got a square root q up the top and a q by itself down the bottom. So we'll put the q down the bottom and then we've still got this r here. So if we want to put it inside the square root, we'll need to square it. So then what we can do is we can substitute in our numbers here. So because it's an electron, we can just look up its mass on the data sheet. So this is equal to 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 times the two times the potential, which we're given in the question is 350. Then we divide by Q, which is the charge on the electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19, and then R squared, and the 7.5 centimeters, so 0 0.075 squared. So solving this, we end up with 8.4 times 10 to the minus 4 Teslas. Now in part B, we're asked what's the angular speed, and we know V is equal to omega R, so omega is equal to V on R, and V is this thing, so this is the square root of 2VQ on M, and then when, let's put the R inside the square root again, so we'll just do R squared, so then we can just substitute in, so this is the square root of 2 times 350, times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19, divided by 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31, times 0 0.075 squared. And solving that, we end up with 1.5 times 10 to the 8 radians per second. So with part C, we're then asked what would happen if we did it with helium nuclei. So this is actually the fun part. If we consider the charge on an electron versus a helium nuclei, an electron has a negative charge of E, and a helium nuclei consists of two protons and two neutrons. So it's got a charge of plus 2E. So it's got double the charge of the electron. However, protons and neutrons are much, much heavier than electrons. So the other difference is that the mass of the helium nuclei is much, much greater than the mass of the electron. So if we now look at our magnetic field equation here, we've got that B is equal to the square root of, let's put this as 2M capital V, the potential, divided by QR squared. And we can rearrange this to get an expression for the radius. So we can just literally swap the magnetic field here and the radius. So we've got that the radius is equal to the square root of 2mv over qb squared. So if the magnetic field and potential remain the same, it's just the mass and the charge that we need to worry about. Now for the helium, the mass is much, much bigger, but the charge is just double. So the much, much bigger is going to win out and we're going to end up with a much, much bigger radius. So helium has a much larger radius, which makes sense given that it's so much heavier. You'd expect that it would take longer to overcome its inertia and get it to change direction. So in part D, it then says, well, what's an industrial application of this? And this is actually what is used in mass spectrometers. So in mass spectrometers, we've got charged particles coming into a magnetic 
field like this. And if we have a nice light particle coming in, it's going to change direction fairly quickly and bend like this and land fairly close to the place where it entered. Now, if on the other hand, we have something which is heavier going in, it's going to take longer to change its direction and it's going to land further from where it entered. So by measuring where these particles land, we can actually work out what their masses are. And this can be used to split elements into different isotopes of that same element just by measuring where it lands.